Euro Gold is driven by being the best civil engineering contractor in the Northwest, ensuring its clients are given the highest level of service that they deserve. Euro Gold work in a wide range of industry sectors, including house building, highways, commercial and industrial build. La Vita is an award-winning, independently run Italian restaurant. Located on Rose Lane in the heart of Liverpool, real Italian style dishes, using the best ingredients, skillfully prepared by our chefs. Come and try our serious Italian experience. Mulligan's Funeral and Monumental Services are a family-owned funeral service, first established by the late Brian Mulligan in 1996. We provide funeral homes in Gorton, Manchester and Reddish, Stockport, and we pride ourselves on giving a friendly and professional service to all the families who use our service. Contact us on 0161 432 0809. Hello everyone and welcome to the show. On the 20th of March 1993, two litter bombs exploded in Warrington, killing three-year-old Jonathan Ball and 12-year-old Tim Parry. This was a terrible time for both families. It would be quite easy for Colin and Wendy Parry to feel bitter, but they have dedicated their lives to peace and reconciliation. And on the 20th of March 2000, they opened the beautiful new Peace Centre in Warrington. I began by asking Colin to describe to me what he was doing on the day the two bombs exploded. We'd been over to Manchester where Wendy's parents lived. We hadn't had the car radio on on the way back. And when we drove up the road, there were clusters of neighbours in the street, which was kind of odd in itself. And uh, the neighbour from next door to us said, have you heard there's been a bomb in town? And we were amazed, said, absolutely no, no. So um, we then went in the house and started phoning around. And Wendy spoke to the friend, one of Tim's friends, who'd gone into town with him. And the friend's grandmother said, um, Pierce, the boy, had been injured. So you can imagine from being surprised and horrified there's a bomb, we suddenly thought, dear God, has Tim been affected? So we drove into the hospital. Uh, as you can imagine, there were lots of people jockeying for position to get to the front desk to ask questions about members of their family that maybe they couldn't account for. And eventually um, got to the desk, described Tim, um, and they checked the list and they said there's nobody matching that description. So Wendy then left the hospital to drive back home in case we'd passed him as he was leaving town and we were driving into the hospital. So I was on my own for perhaps an hour, <coughs> excuse me, and a Catholic priest, for reasons I've never really understood why, approached me and asked me uh, why I was there. I said, um, we're trying to account for our son. We'd accounted for Dominic and Abby in the meantime. And he uh, set about checking around the hospital himself. And meanwhile, Wendy came back and not long after she came back, this priest asked us, would we go into a private room? And I know for me, and I'm sure for Wendy, I had an awful feeling that we were going to get some bad news. Tim's mission that day was to buy a pair of Everton football shorts, because just a few weeks earlier, he had his appendix removed. He was not allowed to play sports, but managed to con Wendy that after about three or four weeks, he could play in goal because it's not very strenuous. So he played in goal for the school team, saved the penalty, and suddenly he wanted to be Neville Southall, who was then Everton's goalkeeper. So his mission was, I want a pair of Everton football shorts. That's what he went into town for. The surgeon who was operating on Tim came into the room, and he was still dressed in his green coveralls, and he had an envelope, manila envelope, and he, he said, can you identify these? 
and it's a St. Christopher chain and a watch he wore and the watch had a canvas strap and I noticed the strap was stained and um, I said yes they're our sons and he said well I've got some really bad news for you we've been operating on your son for the past couple of hours he's been seriously injured and I don't think he'll live the night but if you'll excuse me and then he left and you can imagine the void in that room at the time having heard these words it's just beyond horrifying we were stunned I don't think either of us spoke for a little while no. while we tried to absorb what we just heard. On the day of the bomb, of course, uh, Jonathan Ball was killed instantly. Now, your son, Tim, was taken to hospital and was injured, and then he later died five days later. Mm -hmm. What was it like during those five days? What did you actually go through as a mother? Um, I think when um, they told us he wouldn't survive the night, um, that was a, a, a night where all the family got together and, and I think the next day um, when we went to the hospital we were obviously surprised that um, you know, he, he was still with us because of what had been told to us the day before. So I think at that time you start to get hope that they were wrong and, and things are, you know, are going to get better. We spent some time with him um, by his bed, which was a shock, because um, obviously he was, he was bandaged everywhere. Um, you couldn't see his, his face um, because of bandages. Um, but the next day he was then taken to Liverpool to go through um, a scanner to, um, to see what um, brain activity was, was there. Um, and I think at that time, um, it, it's like, one minute you've got lots of hope and you think that he, he will survive, he will get over this. And then somebody will say something to you and you think, no, he's not. Um, and we were it was very up and down for all of those five days. And then on the last day, um, we obviously had the, we didn't have any choice. They said to us, there's no brain activity whatsoever. Um, so basically it's the machine that's keeping him alive. So that was then when we, we um, switched the machine off. This tragedy, most people would feel bitter and obviously very upset. But both of you turned to reconciliation and peace. And then you started, well you set up your own uh, peace, didn't you, peace um, foundation. Yes, it wasn't immediate. I mean, the, the catalyst for the idea of getting involved in peace building came from BBC. They made a special panorama programme which took us through Ireland, both sides of the border, and across to Boston in the US. And that was a one month, it took a month to film this programme. It was extremely tiring and extremely tough on us. But uh, along the way, um, the one bright spot in the whole month I have to say, was going to a, a peace farm in Coleraine mm. where there was a group called the Peace People. Uh, and they, they had a, a farm where young people, Catholic, Protestant, Nationalist, Unionist, didn't matter, mm. but people who believed in non-violence would gather each weekend and form friendships and alliances and, and look after some animals and, and basically keep the place looking prim and proper. And that was the one thing that left its mark on us, that maybe maybe young people especially, which these were, doing their bit could change the, the awful history of, of Northern Ireland. Mm. So uh, it cl clearly planted a seed and we came home. And, and again, it wasn't immediate, but we thought about what we could do. And we had a friend who was a youth club leader and we spoke to him <clears throat> and said we had an idea to bring kids from Dublin, Belfast and Warrington together. Um, we came up with the name of the Tim Parry Scholarship and would he help us? And he said, yes, he would. Mm. So then it was a question of, through our contacts in Ireland, and in particular a, a friend in Glen Cree down in the south, and guys in the north, we said to them, can you find eight kids from Northern Ireland, ideally a mix from nationalist and unionist backgrounds. Eight kids from the south didn't matter what their backgrounds were because they were in a different sort of world. And, and we picked eight kids from Warrington and we brought all 24 together in a one week long program. Took place in Ireland because we had nowhere in England to do it. And it was a great success. Uh, I'm not saying we turned kids into academics, we didn't, but we we've broke down barriers 
you know, these kids were uneasy about meeting somebody from another country, <coughs> or in the case of Northern Ireland, somebody from the other side, and yet they found kids are kids. Mm. By the end of the week, they're all friends. And we, we ran that for several years, and it was a great, great success. Mm. And of course, it was going so well that Wendy said to me, if we're gonna do this, we need to scale up and do more of it. And also, we need a place in Warrington because we can't always run it in Ireland because the Irish kids wanted to come over here. So the idea of a peace centre was born. We decided that we wanted to, to build something in Warrington. Um, it, in a way, is a living memorial to Tim and Jonathan. Um, so it's, it's a special building. Um, on the, the day of the opening, it was lovely. It wasn't finished at that time but we we said we wanted to do something on the anniversary so the seventh anniversary of the bombing um the you know there was lots of family here lots of politicians it was it was a lovely day um the next day um the builders came back in and um, we eventually opened for the first visitors in november of that year so but we you know, we have done so much in this building. It's part of Warrington's history. It's um, it's part of our us. History. It's yeah. part of our history, yeah. <clears throat> um, and um, it, it carries Tim and Jonathan's name, which is something that we've always wanted to do. Whatever we've done, we've we've always wanted to keep them alive. Um, and through the charity, through the, the, the centre, um, and that's been our goal. Yeah, and of course, because of the great work that you both done over a period of time, you were recognised by the Queen and you both received the OBE. That must have been really something special for you. Yeah, it was a great honour. Um, we didn't get it at the same time. I don't know quite why, but there were some years in yeah. between. Yes. Um, but yes, it was. It was great to be getting that kind of recognition. You know as well as I do, there's a tragedy, people say how bad, how they feel about it, and a week later, naturally enough, they get on with their lives, and it's consigned to the back of their memory, at some point forgotten about. I couldn't countenance the whole idea of Tim just being another victim of Northern Ireland Troubles. So for us, whether people give us awards or not, or people support this charity or yeah. this building, it, it's all about Tim. For us, it's all about Tim, he was a great lad, he was 12 years old, yeah. full of life, full of ideas, full of fun. He was the fun guy in the three, he was always messing about, larking around, uh, often to the annoyance of his mother, but there you go. You know, he was a lovely, lovely lad. He very rarely had a moody face on him, he was always joyful. Mm -hmm. And he's gone in an instant, he's ripped out of your life. It's terrible, it's absolutely terrible. As we can all see, Colin and Wendy are two remarkable people. They lost their lovely son on that day and nobody can replace him. Now we're going to take a little break. Don't go away. In part two, we'll be chatting to them both about the Peace Centre. See you soon. Eurogold is driven by being the best civil engineering contractor in the Northwest ensuring its clients are given the highest level of service that they deserve. Eurogold work in a wide range of industry sectors, including house building, highways, commercial and industrial build. Lola Vita is an award-winning, independently run Italian restaurant. Located on Rose Lane in the heart of Liverpool, real Italian style dishes using the best ingredients, skillfully prepared by our chefs. Come and try our serious Italian experience. Mulligan's Funeral and Monumental Services are a family-owned funeral service, first established by the late Brian Mulligan in 1996. We provide funeral homes in Gorton, Manchester and Reddish, Stockport, and we pride ourselves on giving a friendly and professional service to all the families who use our service. Contact us on 0161 432 
0809. Welcome back. Now this week we're telling you a story about Tim Parry who sadly lost his life when a bomb exploded in Warrington. Now we're going to rejoin his mum and dad, that's Colin and Wendy Parry, and they're going to be telling us about the Peace Centre. I know that you've had various VIP people over the years, but I know that Mo Morlam was especially helpful to you. Yes, Mo was a special person who, um, right at the beginning when she found out what we wanted to do, um, has asked us how long it would take us and we would like well who knows you know it could be years so she challenged us to do it in 12 weeks to raise <coughs> the money to build the building and they, we said there was no way we would be able to do that um, but she said we might help um, so Mo and Colin worked closely together and um, and we did it in the 12 weeks we didn't have the money in the bank but we'd been promised the, the money so um, the plan started then and the building started going up. Um, so, but she, was, she just helped as much as she could. Um, she was brilliant. We built the building in conjunction with another charity, the NSPCC. We both co-funded the three million pound building, both putting in 1.5 million. And uh, we also then were approached by a local youth club who wanted to operate from here. So there, there have been three partners in this building since it opened. Um, for our part, the building has always been about <coughs> getting kids in, um, getting uh, entertainment happening here too, because Wendy often would organize events, which were fundraising events. The building is ideal for fundraising events, and they were always great because people would come year after year after year. But essentially, the, the Peace Centre was here to work with young people uh, who were uh, perhaps at risk of extremism from one form or another. And of course, as time went on, it ceased to be so much Irish terrorism. And our work sort of morphed into meeting that challenge rather more than the Irish one, because touch wood, following the Good Friday Agreement, there's a lot more peace in Ireland than there was. worked with young people and then we decided we should be supporting victims as well. So the other mainstream of our work is supporting victims of terrorism anywhere in the world but who live in Britain. So if somebody was injured in uh, the beach attack in, in, when was it, North Africa a few years ago or the Bataclan in Paris or anything else like that, if the UK residents we offer our services and we help victims and we've helped something like a thousand people impacted by the Manchester Arena bombing couple of years ago. So Wendy, I know that the Peace Centre is a beautiful building here, but it's also available for hire. Yes, we, we have lots of hire. We've got residential here as well, so we have lots of um, youth organisations using the, the residential. Um, the, the, we've got a, a number of rooms that are hired out by companies for conferences and meetings. Um, we also have the youth club here um, during the week, so more often than not, the, the building has got people in it. Um, during the weekend as well, we had football teams and all sorts of different activities, so um, it can be hired out yeah, at any time. You've also got living accommodation. Yeah, the residential, which um, is, um, is used by youth groups and um, we use it ourselves when we bring young people over from different places. Now Colin, of course at this moment in time um, the Peace Centre needs some work done to it. It also needs an input of some uh, financial support. Tell us about that and uh, tell us how people can help you. Well, it's a perfect storm. We've got our two partners both quitting the building for different reasons. Not that they're not happy here, but the youth club has built its own youth club and the NSPCC is relocating its people to Liverpool. So in the near future, we'll just be ourselves here. 
So the costs of running this building, heating it, lighting it, maintaining it, will all fall on us, which is clearly a major burden. And along with that, the activity going on here is much reduced from pre-COVID, even though it's starting to pick up, it's still at a much lower level, so our income is way down. And thirdly, the building, although it's structurally a lovely building to look at and it looks great, if you start to drill down and look at the things that matter, like heating systems and water supplies and energy savings, it's hopelessly out of date. It's of its day. It's from the late 1990s. And the costs of running this building are excessively high because we need to upgrade things, so many things. Um, and that's the uh, scenario we face. We need to find people who've got either the personal wealth or they, or they have uh, organisations which would like to support a charity such as this, which is actually pretty well unique. I don't know of any other charity in the UK that does what we do on the scale that we do it. But it's reaching those people to say, help us make sure this building can be re-equipped, repurposed and survives for many more years to come. And you've also got wonderful office accommodation that people could, could move in here and, and rent. You've got beautiful parking area and I have to say your gardens at the back where people can go out and relax and maybe have conference out there. Uh, it's beautiful. You're absolutely right. Yes, it's a multi-purpose, multi-functional building. Uh, and yes, we are trying to attract businesses in to house themselves here. Yeah. take out office space with us, not just on a temporary basis, but move their offices in. We'll, we'll find space to give them the equipment and the office accommodation they need, and Wendy's working very hard at that. How can people contact you? How can they help out? How can they donate? What, what would you like people to do? Well, they can either go care of our website, which is peace-foundation.org.uk. They can tweet us, they can write us a letter, um, they can email us, care of uh, Wendy or I, care of the Peace Foundation. Any, any normal means of communication will respond. Wendy, it's something like um, 28 years since your lovely son Tim passed away and Jonathan Ball, of course. How are you as a family coping with it now? Um. I suppose the same way we've coped right from the beginning, really. We're a very close family anyway, so we help one another. But um, we've also got our grandchildren now as well that um, are very close to Tim, even though they didn't know him. Um, as a family, we still talk about Tim as though he's with us. So they know him, um, I think, almost as well as we do. Um, but we, yeah, we cope as a family um, because that's the way we've always done it. And, and of course, in the reception area here, you've got a lovely Doves for Peace area. Yes, this was, again, I credit Wendy with this idea. It's simple. If people wanted to have their name individually or their family name on one of those Peace Doves, then they had paid a small amount because there's a th I think there's a three grade system, gold, silver and white. I think the gold cost the most. But, you know, some people like the idea that their name was visually there in this centre saying, hey, we support what these guys are doing. I suppose it's a bit, it's a bit like the, um, the hospice do on, uh, at Christmas when they put stars on the Christmas tree. Um, our doves are here permanently rather than just for Christmas. And of course, there's so much history in this building now. It's a big part of both your lives. Yeah. I'm sure you feel that your son is here with you, supporting you today. It would be a shame if it had to close. It would. Um, 
I, I, I can't think about it closing, but if we don't get the funding to do what we need to do and, and keep it open, then the doors will have to close. Um, and then, you know, if the doors close, it might well start get to, you know, get vandalised, which is not, I can't even think about that. Um, but yeah, I think if the, um, the centre closed, we would still try and find the funding to continue the work that we've done. So the, the, the work of the foundation and, and the actual Peace Centre are, are completely different, really. Um, and wherever we can, you know, do our work, we will continue to do it. Well, it's been a privilege to meet you both today. We wish you the very best of luck to you and your families in the future. And we hope that the Peace Centre can stay open in Warrington. It's really important. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. It would be a real shame if the Peace Centre had to close. Hopefully, somebody will come to their rescue. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Colin and Wendy for joining us on the show tonight. All our thoughts and prayers are with them and their family. Now that brings us to the end of the show for this week. Henry McGlade is back with his show from County Mayo next Thursday evening at 7 o'clock and we are here at 7.30 with the Irish in the UK. Until then, take good care and we'll see you next time. <laughs>